Hello! Today I'm taking a look at Red Dead Redemption 2, the prequel story to Rockstar's 2010 release Red Dead Redemption, and a game that was released to considerable acclaim back in 2018. Now, the Red Dead games have become an increasingly respected series from Rockstar, and where Red Dead Revolver was released to generally good reviews in 2004, it was the John Marston adventure from 2010 that really propelled the games into the enduring Game of the Year levels of repute that left their audiences wanting more from the story. And indeed, looking now at Red Dead Redemption 2, such was the broad anticipation and the subsequent success of the prequel that I've since had conversations with friends who aren't even really gamers uh, and are much more into movies and stuff like that. And these guys are telling me that they bought the game because of all of this hype and they were completely amazed, you know, saying it's one of the best stories, you know, let alone video games that they've ever experienced. So in this episode, I'm going to delve into some of the intricacies of Red Dead Redemption 2, looking at the themes, setting, story, along with the historical elements, character arcs and gameplay that comprise to make it a very unique uh, and enduring success of the 8th generation console cycle. And kicking off, I think it's firstly worth talking about the context of the Red Dead games, and particularly Red Dead Redemption 2, when it comes to the creative over of the various individuals and developers uh, that now comprise the brand of Rockstar. And what I mean by this is that the prevailing flagship series that's synonymous with these guys uh, and the writing credits of Dan Hauser is, of course, Grand Theft Auto. And I've often seen Red Dead Redemption touted as a GTA set in the Wild West sort of thing, which in some respects, particularly around gameplay, you know, I can sort of understand. But broadly speaking, I also think that that's a gross oversimplification um, and potentially a disservice to what the Red Dead games actually bring to the table, uh, narratively, thematically, uh, and so on. And I think it's worth addressing that distinction here. For example, while the games operate broadly in the same narrative and gameplay territory, insofar as we work through an open-world, mission-based story, generally inhabiting and interacting with characters who operate on the fringes of the law, I would argue that the GTA games have always, since their first release in the 90s, driven story and gameplay by a salacious, dark-humoured and purposefully inflammatory precedent through which they've succeeded very well. And those of us who were around for the first games, and particularly GTA 3's release in 2001, may well recall how these titles caused outrage and had people adopting some mad rhetoric about video games inspiring violent crime and serial killing and problems among young people. But you know, causing that controversy and making games that were purposefully absurdist, Tarantino-esque pastiches of Scorsese, Coppola and De Palma and all of that sort of thing, you know, that was very much the appeal of the GTA games and that's what they traded on. And from Vice City's references to Scarface and Carlito's Way to GTA 5's nod towards Sexy Beast and so on, we've got this amusing homage to gangster epics and Hollywood crime, you know, influencing the course of Grand Theft Auto. But turning to Red Dead Redemption, I think the controversy and the tongue-in-cheek humour is dialed right down uh, and largely traded out for a story with a little more heart and a little more sincerity to it. And I mean that with no discredit to GTA, but where we could easily have seen Red Dead Redemption follow in these footsteps uh, as a crazy violent parody of Clint Eastwood and spaghetti westerns and, you know, these cinematic impressions of the Wild West. What we actually get is something that's much more rooted in the authentic history of the West uh, and is propelled forward by slightly more considered ideas of freedom, liberty, industrialization, progress, and our central character's attempts to find meaning amidst the flux of all this change and attempt to reconcile with the past. And of course, you know, the clue is in the title, Redemption, you know. So I think that's a worthwhile distinction to make. And while Red Dead Redemption 2 does enable violence uh, and controversial events to take place, such as massacring innocents in the way that other games, for example, Witcher 3, actively does not allow players to do, like you physically can't, I would still say for the most part, and particularly with the canonical story, uh, following the Vanderlind gang and Arthur Morgan and his living legacy of redemption through John Marston, it certainly relies less on violence, uh, or at least gratuitous violence and, and shock value, uh, than 
than previous Rockstar games do, and it makes for a very fascinating story, and sincere story, that I'll delve into over the course of this episode. So, before delving into the story and that sort of stuff, let's first consider the world and the setting, because the environments, the locations, and everything that comprises the free-roaming backdrop on which our story takes place is wonderfully done. And for the first time in a game, I found myself periodically stopping to take screenshots of the scenery in my gameplay. Such was the beauty of the lighting and the terrain and all of these things. Uh, And since I've been getting back into Twitter and social lately, I've noticed this subculture that's sprung up around virtual photography, as people call it. And it's really wonderful to see these compositions and these screenshots that people have taken of their Red Dead gameplay. Such is the beauty and the painstaking detail in the environments. Uh, And I've really got into following this sort of thing lately. But beyond the aesthetics and this kind of beautifying element of the terrain, and looking at the context of the setting, what we have in Red Dead Redemption 2 is the sprawling biodiversity and expanse of the United States kind of packaged down and compressed into a set of fictional locations, which offers the freedom to explore various terrains from the arid New Mexico, Texas, Arizona sort of surrounds of Armadillo, to the Louisiana vibes of Saint Denis, through to the snow-capped areas of Mount Hagen uh, and the Midwestern Great Plains. And each of these territories broadly represents aspects of of southern and midwestern America that comprise the tumultuous uh, and ever-evolving Old West that, you know, America was expanding into by the end of the 19th century. And I think each of these locations contributes hugely to the atmosphere and the desire to explore and just ride around and, you know, experience the game. So, as I already touched on, I think Red Dead Redemption 2 has more in common with real-world history, and also classic American literature too, than it does with this spaghetti western idea of the Old West. Because across these locations and, and pocketed throughout the story, you know, the maison scene and the design of the game are elements that are essential to the historical context and the complex evolution of America that dictated this period. And while I'm certainly no expert on American history, I think there were several clear observations of the time, um, and I think the writers did a great job at layering this world with contextual references, and not really even labouring on them necessarily as plot points, but they simply added these things in to to show flourishes of of world building and and authenticity that really lends to the time period and this transitional, you know, flux of change, you know, and this atmosphere that was taking place at the time, which is very evident in the game. For example, something that's dwelt upon early in the story is the echoes and the lasting legacy of the American Civil War. And that permeates this game, as I say, particularly in the early stages. And this ideological divide between North and South is acknowledged in several instances, from occasional random encounters with encampments of of Confederate veterans, to the residents of Lemoyne, dubbing Dutch and his crew New Englanders and Yankees, you know, during our tenure there, which perhaps hints at this lingering Confederate sentiment, but also emphasising, I think, the alienation of Dutch's gang, which I think is a core element of the story, which I'll touch on shortly. In similar fashion, we have short missions and cutaways that don't necessarily progress the core story, or even really offer much character development, but they touch on the cultural and political makeup of the time, ranging from the women's suffrage movement uh, through to race relations, and even the allure of the West and the flux of immigration that was seen in the wake of the gold rush and later the oil boom, which is perhaps best exemplified by the the travelling German couple, uh, sorry, the travelling German family that we rescue early on in the story. And this reflects this push west and immigration that people made in their thousands in the hope of fortune and opportunities that was the promise of the west. Another significant aspect of play in terms of both story and enjoyment is the various train services available in the game. And once again, historically speaking, trains were the driving force behind the Industrial Revolution and integral to the transport of products and people that enabled the American push west to be as viable and as rapid as it was. So it's prudent to note that although trains in Red Dead Redemption 2 are primarily sources of income, uh, transport and 
basically just a bit of fun in the game world, they are in many ways the symbol of everything that Dutch Vanderlind, and by extension our gang, you know, of nomadic outlaws, conspire against uh, throughout the story. You know, trains are the harbingers of technology and change at this time, and they've enabled this wild, unknown world of freedom, liberty, and not to mention the indigenous people, uh, to be traversed and tamed. So I think the trains were a great inclusion in terms of gameplay, but also thematically, and this industrialization and mechanization that was so integral to the development of, of modern America is rooted firmly, you know, by the trains that are apparent. Uh, in Red Dead Redemption 2. And finally on that note, in this note of mechanisation, um, and just before moving into the story, one of my favourite aesthetic touches in, in the UI design of the game was this historical nod to the invention of photography, and particularly the uh, the wet plate photography process, which informs the aesthetic of the game's loading screens. And what we see here is these photographic sheets being developed into monochrome images, uh, of the rural west while the game's loading. And this is a great historical reference, because although photography was invented in England and France in the mid-19th century, it became a hugely popular modern medium that became symbolic for capturing, you know, this modern country, you know, modern America. And the photographs we have today of frontiersmen, trailblazers, outlaws and Native Americans during this push west is really the first time that we saw a country's history and development being documented by the photograph rather than the romanticism of, of oil painting, for example. And so photography has had a very rich history uh, in American tradition ever since, from Carlton Watkins, who was you know, around at the time that Red Dead Redemption 2 set, all the way through to Ansel Adams, Robert Frank, and, and so many others, you know, whose oeuvre has been dictated by this this documentary, this documenting of America, you know, from from these early periods into the modern day. And photography is, of course, also featured in-game uh, with the opportunity to visit portrait studios. Uh, and once more, as with the movie theatres and the saloons, this isn't a necessity of story, but it's simply a nice addition that contributes to the world building and our idea of the time, which I think was a really nice, you know, interactive detail to include. So, moving on and inching into story now, I touched on Dutch's antagonism towards the changing world, which he believes comes at the expense of personal freedom. This ideological divide forms the thematic backbone uh, of the early story, where our gang of nomadic outlaws, you know, who are operating on the fringes of society, are being pitted against the forces of change in all of its forms, you know, technology, oligarchs, captains of industry, such as uh, Cornwall. Um, modern policing agencies, and of course organised crime. And the player character Arthur Morgan, as a loyal ally of Dutch, shares these sentiments about resisting change early on, and as he remarks to Trelawney about midway through the game, everywhere we go there's just more civilization. And for example, a symbolic moment at the turn of chapter 3 is the gang's arrival in Saint-Denis, where we witness the fruits of industry, you know, the chugging black smoke of factory chimneys, the wide tarmac boulevards, uh, a modern police force, trams, and a huge railway station. And all of this comes in stark contrast to the horse-drawn, mud-track towns of Valentine, Le Moyne, and Strawberry that we've seen so far. And indeed, as Dutch patronisingly remarks, um, he calls Saint-Denis the eighth wonder of the modern world, and it's this point in the story that the conflict between old and new, liberty and authority, really starts to kick off. And for my part, you know, arriving in that city and seeing this black smoke billowing up into the blue sky, as Dutch dismissively remarks that this is the future, I felt that was a powerful image um, and a powerful pivotal moment in the game, which in many ways resonates, perhaps, with the world we live in today, I suppose we could say, you know, this technological start point of mass production and pollution in a capital-driven world. So in many ways, you know, across America and across, you know, in the industrialising West, this was the fruits of the Industrial Revolution, which is um, interestingly explored through the eyes of these outlaws in Red Dead Redemption 2. Now, returning to Arthur and the Vandalin gang, this narrative approach was interesting because rather than 
previous Red Dead games and earlier GTA games, which have a Lone Ranger quality to them, where John Marston or Tommy Vassetti or CJ or whoever is doing jobs at the behest of others, you know, with a degree of detachment and self-interest. Red Dead Redemption 2 focuses on the interests of a collective group, and gameplay is weighted towards communal activity and ensemble character development, whether it's making money, acquiring food, or performing primary and secondary story quests. And although Arthur Morgan is the player character, he's by no means elevated above the others, or presented as an overtly complex or ambitious protagonist early on. In fact, quite to the contrary, he's governed by a very simple philosophy of loyalty. And it is, in fact, those around him and those he interacts with that are fraught with personal agendas, personal issues um, that are developed over the course of the story. And by way of this quiet loyalty and simplicity, I think Arthur is, you know, this unobtrusive window into events. Uh, And again, particularly early on, uh, it is his efficiency and agreeable nature and simplicity that prompts his story quests, you know, on behalf of Dutch and the others, because he is this kind of trusted confidant um, rather than anything else. So this was quite a big step change uh, for the way these games were written and, and kind of constructed. And I liked this angle a lot and how each of these secondary characters in the gang represents something about this particular time and place in America. And going back to American literature, uh, as I touched on uh, briefly earlier, the ensemble composition of this story, the considered symbolic characters and Arthur's backseat status as an observer, almost a kind of narrator quality to him. Uh, It really reminds me of Herman Melville's novel Moby Dick, which is considered, among others, as, as a example of the great American novel. And in Moby Dick, we have this disparate crew of nomads from all walks of life. You know, such were those that were attracted to the dangerous and remote profession of whaling. And these many characters from the Native American uh, Tashtego to the Polynesian Queequeg, you know, we have the priest Father Mapple, Starbuck, and so on. They are all corralled and brought together under the command of the driven and obsessive character of Captain Ahab while at the same time each representing certain themes and ideas about race, faith, friendship, industry, and so on, that were pertinent to this this particular time in America. So, looking at this and turning to Red Dead Redemption 2, in similar fashion, I think, we have the variously marginalised types that comprise the Vandalin gang. You know, Charles, Sean, Lenny, Strauss, even Sadie. You know, each of these characters from various walks of life, find themselves ostracised, oppressed, or otherwise at odds with the structures of, quote marks, civilization. So they find themselves seeking their own brand of liberty uh, and fall under the leadership of Dutch. Now Dutch, much like Captain Ahab, is a strong-willed and firm hand at the tiller, but gradually, you know, he's revealed to have an increasingly manic and unravelled drive towards his own goals and his own vendettas, at the expense of those he commands. Much like the narrator Ishmael in Moby Dick, we also have Arthur Morgan. And like Ishmael, he's a much more reflective, objective observer in the group, almost like a narrator, which is pointedly shown by the fact he keeps a journal, which also contributes to the record-keeping gameplay, you know, the menu design and, and the reward system through discovering new creatures and items and stuff. And as we follow Arthur's journey through the game, we see his interactions develop wider character stories and perspectives, whether it's helping Charles defend the sacred buffalo herds or helping Strauss with his ruthless debt collecting. And most importantly, with Arthur being a trusted and veteran confidant of Dutch, we have great insight into Dutch's character development. Uh, And in many ways, Arthur is a, a rather passive, objective insight into the world, while the more central character around which the core events and the themes orbit is arguably Dutch Vanderlind. So, in light of this, I think Arthur was a fantastically written character for the player to partake in the story as, and I want to delve into him a little more, because while I've seen some people arguing and comparing and contrasting uh, between John Marston and, and Arthur Morgan as protagonists, and some prefer John Marston as the lead within the series, 
I think Arthur does a number of things to balance story and, and character progression and also offer player agency in the game. And personally speaking, while some found him a bit too austere and reserved in his demeanour, I think this was necessary when placing him alongside strong personalities such as John, Dutch and Micah, who in many ways command the stage, as it were, in, in the scenes that they feature in. And Arthur's strength as a character, you know, as a player character, is in being quite reactive to these active personalities rather than charging forward with his own will and his own agenda. And again, you know, as I'll touch on with his broad arc, this is something that actually gets addressed later in the game. Um, and his prolonged story arc is this gradual confrontation with Dutch and confronting his own mortality, uh, which I'll touch on shortly. Now, looking at earlier Rockstar titles, we often have protagonists who are thrown into a new setting and meeting a new bunch of characters as they get out of jail or return from afar and so on. Uh, but by contrast, this game throws us immediately into the flux of action and a set of existing relationships as we travel through a snowstorm uh, to find a safe haven. And this is a bit of a, a slow-burning introduction, owing to the size of the cast, but it excellently helps deliver on the themes in the greater arc of the story, because rather than earlier rock star protagonists who start from the bottom and work their way up towards achievement, independence and reward, Red Dead Redemption 2 is a game about decline. It's about a family falling apart, and it's about the decay of the Old West and a certain way of doing things, which in many ways is embodied by the implacable and the weathered character of Arthur, who is increasingly you know, outmoded, uh, as we witness in this new world. So it makes sense that rather than beginning at the bottom and building up relationships and building up reward and autonomy as we progress, narratively speaking, we actually start midway through an existent story and witness these established relationships crumble away. The tone is set by the fact we begin in motion, uh, in the middle of a snowstorm, fighting for survival, and in the opening cutscene, the character of Davy has died on the journey, which is the first of several casualties that hints at this sort of grim fatedness with which the story unfolds. And again, it's perfectly captured by the character of Arthur, I think. And long before his revealed illness, or the sepia-tinted musical montages that we get as we progress towards the end of the game, I think from the very outset, the feel of the story has a certain desperation and a sad but beautifully crafted futility about it, uh, which is delivered through Arthur's increasingly resigned disposition towards the gang's efforts um, and Dutch's far-fetched ideas of freedom. So this is great, uh, and Arthur's emblematic of the outmoded old world uh, and a sound vehicle through which we experience the themes and story. But while Arthur is quite a simple man, being governed almost exclusively by loyalty rather than any lofty ambitions, this doesn't mean he's a boring or underdeveloped character, as I've seen some critics argue, nor does it mean he's a simpleton, as his, com as his comrades frequently joke about him. And quite to the contrary, it is precisely because of Arthur's loyalty that his character develops so well uh, over the course of the game. And the real rub of this character-driven ensemble and friction of the story is bound to this decline in Arthur's trust of Dutch, and as he becomes increasingly unsettled by the tightening net of the law and the changing world around them, you know, uh, Cornwall, Pinkertons, O'Driscolls, and Dutch's mania, Arthur, for perhaps the first time in years, reconsiders where his loyalties lie and what he's doing. <laughs> and confronted with his own mortality on top of that, this is where we see the pursuit of redemption come into play. And there's a great passing of the torch sentiment to the game where Arthur's final act is to ensure John Marston and his family are ushered out of the chaos of Dutch and the old world and have a chance to thrive and survive in the opportunities of the new world um, which is best explored and I'll, I'll touch on when we get to the epilogue. So I get that some people didn't like Arthur so much and there's this enduring comparison to John Marston going on but I think he works fantastically as this transient, transitional character. 
you know, a futile remnant of the old world whose living legacy is to give John and his family and, and several others in the gang who slip away this opportunity to quietly abandon this doomed mania of Dutch, Micah and, and the Vandeling gang. So on that note, let's touch on Dutch now, who, as I've stated, is a very flamboyant, driven and Captain Ahab-esque component of the game, around which much of the story hinges. And I think a question worth considering, which even the characters discuss in the game, is whether Dutch, at the end of it all, unravels and gradually changes for the worse by seeing fatal events transpire, or whether he was always this slightly dubious, untrustworthy personality who was willing and capable to cut and run on his comrades, you know, when the chips were down. It makes him pretty interpretable and pretty interesting, I think. And if we cast our minds back to the introduction, we have Dutch riding alongside Arthur in the snowstorm, kind of imploring that they get their family food and shelter, you know, in this very caring, kind of fatherly fashion. But fast forwarding to the latter stages of the game, you know, we're storming this oil refinery for bond documents and we have Dutch quite brazenly leaving Arthur for dead. So whether his concern for the family early on is some sort of fraud and affectation or whether events such as his trusted companion Hosea being murdered by Pinkertons profoundly affects him and unhinges him or indeed whether Micah Bell whispering in his ear kind of manipulating him against his comrades is the cause for his sort of change in per persona it's all quite interesting and debatable and, and up in the air with regard to his character arc I think um and he's a looming question mark, I suppose, in many ways, which I really quite like. Uh, and I think it leaves audiences kind of discussing it to this day. But for my part and, and my take on it, uh, I think perhaps it's a combination of all of these factors. Um, and what I grasped in several instances is that Dutch is a man who needs to be in control and he needs to be the cleverest man in the room. And I think until the events that transpire in Red Dead Redemption 2 he was never someone who really had his authority tested or questioned in any meaningful way or had ever been outwitted or confronted um, you know, in any meaningful way. And a prime example of this is the apex of Arthur and Dutch's story arc and where Arthur had been loyal to Dutch for so long without question or complaint. In the final act, we see him request and finally insist that Dutch allows John Marston and his family to escape to safety, you know, while there's still time. And Dutch's reaction to Arthur's insistence exemplifies this lust, or at least this compulsion for control, as he bitterly clings on to Arthur's words, long past the event itself, as if it were a personal slight against him. In similar fashion, we have the Braithwaite scenario, and later the Angelo Bronte scenario. And in both instances, Dutch saunters into these events, thinking himself a crafty, intelligent interloper, who's going to play both sides against one another and profit hugely, only to find that he gets tricked himself, you know, he gets completely outwitted. And in both instances, we see his reaction as very extreme and, and, and violently absolute, with Angelo Bronte being drowned and fed to an alligator by Dutch, and Mrs. Braithwaite's entire, entire family murdered and her house burned down, which shocks even Dutch's veteran comrades, such as Arthur and Hosea. Colmore Driscoll also meets a grisly end as he meets with Dutch under the pretense of a parley only to betray him. And he meets a grisly but quite poetic and cleverly conspired end when his expected escape from the hangman's noose is thwarted and Dutch personally gets to savour the opportunity in seeing him hang, which is just another example of these compulsive Ahab-esque vendettas that Dutch needs to follow through with. He completely diverges and tangents off from the gang's plans to go and see O'Driscoll hang, which is an example of, of this kind of compulsive and, and unravelled nature um, that Dutch has. So, by stark contrast to Arthur's simplicity, we see Dutch as this erratic persona who pendulums back and forth from charismatic niceties, such as when he's attempting to charm Sheriff Lee Gray, to a psychotic monster when he feels undermined, outdone, or threatened in any real or perceived way because of course we see him execute um, 
I can't remember her name, but, you know, the drunk woman. He kind of just executes her out of hand for thinking that she's somehow betrayed him. And the way this progresses with the writing is, is very well paced. And as a player, I found myself increasingly uneasy about him, but still somehow understanding him, or at least wanting wanting to understand him and wanting to believe that the ends justified the means, you know, as he frequently suggested, you know, right up until his point of no return, morally speaking, which I think is the sabotage of the fragile peace treaties between the US Army uh, and the Native American tribes. And the reason this is so reprehensible, as Arthur points out, is that the US Army and the Native American situation you know, is completely divorced from the cat and mouse game between the Vandalin gang and the authorities. They are essentially civilians within this story um, and attempting to navigate their own issues and their own agendas. So Dutch dragging them through the dirt, as it were, you know, tugging the lion's tail and bringing the military might of the US Army to bear on both the Native Americans and, as it turns out, the gang itself, you know, simply as a smokescreen for his own escape. I think this is the point of true departure between Arthur and Dutch um, and, and Arthur's loyalties and belief in Dutch. And in most cases, I think, probably the players too. You know, And, and I think a lot of us... I, I'm aware there's opinions some people don't like Dutch at all from the outset. Uh, some of us kind of enjoyed his, his kind of char charisma um, and his kind of driven nature. But this was a kind of point of divergence. And while Dutch's vengeance upon the aforementioned O'Driscolls um, and Bronte and so on was extreme at least we could argue they were in the criminal game as it were and so the retribution was part and parcel of you know that dog eat dog existence so for me Dutch was an intriguing hero come villain right until the end and even the way he ambivalently murders Micah and spares John and just saunters off without any context without clarity without apology it really underlines the ambiguity of the character and I think it's a perpetual question mark and a subjective opinion as to whether you think he's evil or perhaps remorseful or insane or even some sort of anti-hero by the end. And these silences and unanswered questions I think contribute greatly to Dutch's mystique and by extension, you know, the macro arc and, and the game story in general. So moving on beyond these core personalities, there's the wider ensemble of the gang and the other incidentals we have in this story, which build an immersive and historically pertinent setting. For example, the aforementioned Angelo Bronte, who dwells in the New Orleans-inspired Saint-Denis, is clearly a prototypical mafioso, and while the Sicilian gangs are commonly associated with New York, there was a strong New Orleans connection. Um, early in the Mafia's arrival in the States. So it was a really nice historical nod from the writers to include that scenario there. In similar fashion, we have the Pinkerton Agency. And initially, I thought these guys were a blueprint for the FBI and this development of authority at a federal level, um, which was founded around this time period. But in fact, it transpires that they are based on an actual Pinkerton Agency, who were a private security firm. Um, founded in the 1850s, and these guys actually attempted to sue Rockstar for their portrayal in this title. And as we see in the game, you know, rather than being a legitimate federal law enforcement, they are actually working as private detectives at the behest of Leviticus Cornwall um, to protect his interests and, and hunt down the gang. And finally, we have the aforementioned Native American relations with the US military, and there's a few historical nods here too, with the upstart Eagle Flies being compelled to break the policy of appeasement of his elders in favour of direct action, which echoes, I think, the beginnings of the infamous Red Clouds uh, rise to prominence in his several skirmishes with the military uh, in the 1860s. And furthermore, in a very fleeting scene, which once again is done more for historical context than any real narrative progression, we see the ideological divide within the American military during these peace talks, um, you know, and those that favoured action and those that kind of favoured diplomacy, if you like. So I thought this was a really interesting flourish to illustrate the complexity of this particular time and place in the world, 
And rather having the US military as arbitrarily bad guys um, we have to escape from or fight with, you know, such as how cops and the army are often portrayed in GTA. There's actually a little more weight and a little more colour offered to the thoughts and intentions of, of these authorities as well. Beyond these, the final noteworthy secondary characters that really stood out to me were the Greys and the Braithwaites, and these warring plantation families represent the very real nouveau aristocracy that was built up, you know, from the plantation industries, and these blood feuds that actually occurred at the time, uh, perhaps most famously in the South. And there's plenty of real-world examples, you know, of this sort of family feuding. But for me, it instantly reminded me of another great American novel, uh, which was Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, and the feud between the Shepherdsons and the Grangerfords in that book, which is probably the most memorable and, and violent chapter. It's absolutely crazy. But much like the character of Huck Finn, who's kind of stuck in the middle between these two warring families, so too is Arthur and the Vandalin gang, you know, kind of caught up and embroiled in this family feud um, with both sides and kind of trying to navigate the escalating hostility between these two families until its dramatic climax, uh, which I thought was, you know, a really interesting scenario and a really interesting chapter of the game. So looking at all of these disparate groups, uh, along with the O'Driscolls, you know, the Spanish segment, of course, in Guama, which I haven't even touched on, and several other lesser characters that we encounter, it's clear that there's a heck of a lot happening in this story, and it's worth noting that one of the criticisms of the game um, from its detractors was that there was simply too much going on, you know, owing in part to its size, physically, and of course all of the side quests and supplementary materials. So with these shifting puzzle pieces and conflicting allegiances that influence and shape the story added on top as well, you know, a lot of people felt there was just too much going on and, and they couldn't really grasp or, or get into it. And indeed, even in a long-form discussion, such as I'm doing now, it's impossible to touch on all of the intricacies and the hidden dialogues and the character developments and so on that we have the opportunity to explore, um, you know, in, in the entirety of this game. But just returning to this, you know, the core story and all of the different kind of moving pieces we have, you know, it is simply a case of rather than good versus bad or our gang being a cohesive unit contending against one specific foe, the narrative is consciously chaotic, you know, reflecting perhaps Dutch's erratic demeanour, his constant chancing and feuding that brings all of these hostile forces to bear on us at once. And as I mentioned earlier with regards to the central story, it's it's this idea of the net tightening around them, where if it's not the O'Driscolls that get them, then it's the Pinkertons, and if it's not the Pinkertons, then it's the army. So personally, I quite enjoyed the chaos of it all, and this raising of the stakes that perpetually brought this story forwards, you know, and, and this kind of dramatic decline forwards um, in, into the climactic act. So... On that note, I think it's worth moving into the circumstances leading up to the end game and the epilogue elements of Red Dead Redemption 2. And turning first to the character of Micah Bell, I felt that much like Dutch and Arthur, he was brilliantly crafted as a character, you know, to be this perpetually mistrustful and dubious newcomer to the Vandalin gang. Now, I'm interested to know how others felt about Micah and his reveal as a traitor, because I noticed whenever there was talk of a potential traitor in the game, Micah was often partnered with or appearing alongside Bill. I think it was Bill. And that was interesting because as a player, particularly players attentive to the story and the cinematography, it nodded at this possibility of Micah being a red herring and perhaps, you know, it was Bill or someone else that was the true traitor. So it was interesting how the developers sort of fostered this ambiguity and perhaps attempted to misdirect players before revealing the traitor was indeed, you know, the obvious traitor all along. Beyond this, and irrespective of Micah's betrayal, he is brilliantly written as this increasingly hostile interloper within the gang, you know, witnessed most commonly by his antagonistic, you know, racist, misogynistic, you know, dialogues, and his frequent references to Arthur as a cowpoke or black lung, 
you know, which and all of these interactions are great at fostering this unlikable nature and the assurance that this guy is going to be a problem, you know, at some point down the line. And as I touched on earlier, whether you choose to believe Dutch was always slightly sinister or whether it's Micah who's encouraging this ruthlessness and, uh, and hostile treatment of his own gang, it's one of the enduring questions that looms over the legacy of the story um, and I think is really intriguing and, and debatable uh, up to this day. A final point on Micah, and I suppose the ending in general, is the rather brutal potential for him to execute Arthur in the endgame, depending on your honour rating. And I was speaking with a friend about this recently, um, because he's recently completed the game, and he said he found Arthur's demise in all its eventualities you know, quite unsatisfying, and particularly harrowing if indeed you do get the ending where Micah kills him. And this is another interesting point for discussion, because Micah's survival, of course, prompts the events leading up to the end of the epilogue, which I thought was quite good, um, and in keeping with, of course, you know, the epilogue of, of the first Red Dead game. And although there's no poetic justice for Arthur, um, by the time John Marston rolls around, we do witness justice visited upon Micah, in similar fashion, as I say, to the epilogue of Red Dead Redemption 1. So for my part, I get this, and I think the epilogue worked, uh, but much as my friend suggests, seeing Arthur die like a dog, uh, despite having fulfilled his redemption through assisting John, it was really brutal. Um, in any eventuality of his death, it was quite brutal, and I don't know, I suppose I liked him so much by the end, that although I knew it was inevitable, I just didn't want to see him die. Um, and all these tear-jerking montages where we see him riding through woodland, having flashbacks, you know, indicating that this guy's journey is at an end. You know, it all, in hindsight particularly, but I felt it at the time, it seemed futile and it seemed impossible that Arthur was going to survive this story. But despite that, I just, I didn't want to see him go because I thought he was a great character, which I suppose is a testament to the writing and, and the characterization of Arthur. Um, I don't know how others feel about the conclusion, but yeah, I reacted quite, um, it was quite an emotional, you know, climax for me, um, Arthur's story. So I've touched on the epilogue here, and this was a poignant conclusion, both in terms of conveying the fruits of Arthur's sacrifice, which is John Marston surviving and adapting into the new world, as we've said, and also a bridge uh, between the prequel events and, and the circumstances with which we see John Marston in Red Dead Redemption 1. Now, at this juncture, it's worth noting another criticism that was levelled at the game, which was the length of the epilogue. And amusingly, my aforementioned friend who's been playing the game had messaged me saying he's just completed the Arthur story and moved on to the epilogue, so he expected he'd be completing it that evening, uh, which made me laugh because little did he know the epilogue is completely massive uh, and a game unto itself in many ways. And once again, I think it's up for debate as to whether the epilogue was too long or, or just right or whatever. I mean, I suppose it's subjective because on the one hand, witnessing John Marston find honest work, you know, get a mortgage, build a house, go to the cinema and so on, is this perfect thematic conclusion for industry and change taking hold of the world and finally taming the Wild West and, and many of these people that operated in the Wild West. And my favourite line in there is John's signing of the mortgage papers where the bank clerk says to him, congratulations, you're a real American, we own you and we own your property. But it's also the legacy of Arthur Morgan's redemption. Um, and if nothing else, he did help John Marston and his family survive and thrive in the new world. But in tandem to this, and almost setting up Red Dead Redemption 1, we do see John periodically struggling to shake off his past ways uh, when it comes to defending his employer's farm and later doing bounty quests with Sadie. And as I say, it, it sets the scene for the return to criminality that we see in Red Dead Redemption 1. So, all that said, I think while both chapters of the epilogue were enjoyable and necessary for delivering on the thematic climax of the central story, some elements more than others felt drawn out, uh, personally speaking, and particularly the more trivial missions. And I don't mean 
the clearing up cow crap and building fences because I think that was great at articulating John's lifestyle step change um, and the monotony, the monotony of honest work. But I just felt that some of the fetch quests and, for example, the bounties could have been abbreviated or shifted to optional quests after Micah's death. Because at this stage, I think for many, you know, a lot of players quite reasonably wanted to conclude the game. Uh, but again, that's simply my opinion. And I know others welcomed the opportunity to do story missions as, as John Marston. Uh, and I completely get that. So drawing to a close now, uh, that about wraps up my top level thoughts on the themes and the characters of Red Dead Redemption 2. I haven't touched much on gameplay, but with regards to gameplay story balance at least, it was an interesting and increasingly common approach um, that Rockstar opted to take with the title, where to, re to prevent relying on exhaustive lengthy cutscenes to propel the story forwards, they opted for the middle ground, wherein the player is engaged by riding or walking alongside dialoguing characters to balance player input and exposition, which works to a, gr a degree, um, although you might find yourself kind of mashing the X button, <laughs> if, nothing, if not much else. But where I think this really shined through was with the aforementioned montages, which punctuate aspects of the later game, where Arthur is riding towards his fateful demise. And although we're just riding on our horse and not much else is happening, the interspersing of music, particularly the emotive songs, like That's the Way It Is, um, along with the flashbacks and the dialogue, it really crafted the mood in a cinematic sense, I suppose, um, which the player input kind of is married with with this kind of emotional kind of cutscene quality of the game, albeit, you know, to a limited degree. So, yeah, I really liked those periodic cutaways. You know, there's only kind of two or three in the game, but I thought they were really cool. And finally, since I've touched on it, uh, I would like to comment on the music, which I thought was fantastic. And once again, where it could have very easily gone down the route of some pastiche of Ennio Morricone um, and the distinctive sound of the, the Eastwood films and the Spaghetti Western films, the soundtrack was great at balancing emotive modern country music and lyrical music, such as the aforementioned That's the Way It Is, with some more typically Old West style folk songs. Um, and beyond this, of course, there is the atmospheric sounds of the overworld, which is really, it lends to this unknown and the expanse that, that we're free to explore. And you kind of have this lonely, solitary harmonica at times, which is great. Uh, and it's only really once we get to the tense scenes of, of the story and combat scenarios, um, particularly the for a few dollars more style showdown between Micah, Dutch and Arthur uh, at the end of the game, you can sort of hear the twanging remnant, uh, sort of sound of Ennio Morricone, I think. You know, you get the fraught string music and stuff, which I thought worked really well. So, again, wrapping up, I think, as I say, it's such a massive game, it may well warrant another discussion because I, I know gameplay and, and other secondary elements of the story have been left absent here. But that about wraps up my top-level impression of Red Dead Redemption. And as I say, there's so many intriguing interactions and dialogues and characters that shape ideas about this game and, and shape ideas about the particular time and place that America was in, you know, at this point in history. And this brutal decline of the Old West. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. So there we have it. Um, if you got this far, uh, thanks very much for listening uh, and, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy the episode, uh, please consider sharing uh, and also subscribing, which will keep you updated with my latest posts. Mm -hmm.